This is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God. We're glad you could make it. We're just thankful to be with you, to be able to share His Word one with the other, to find out what our Father hath to say. It's not necessarily so important what man might say, but what our Father says to us is very important. We thank Him for the privilege of reading His letter, understanding His letter, and giving us that guidance that gives us happiness even in this earth age. We thank Him for that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We continue our study on the subject Elijah. Elijah is a name in the Hebrew which really is a statement. And that statement is, My God is Yah. My God is Yahweh. That sacred name of the Hebrew manuscripts. That name that Yah explained to Moses, I am that I am. And from the etymology comes the tetragrammation and the constants that make up that sacred name, Yahweh. We find within that name the statement, it is written in the book of Malachi, Malachi meaning messenger. That, that's the name of a prophet, an angel. I'm not saying that Elijah was an angel. I'm saying that he was certainly that messenger, that messenger that would bring the message John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, and as stated, Malachi, meaning the messenger, declares that Elijah, just before that great day of the Lord, shall return to this earth, bringing us uh, that truth that would turn the hearts of the children back to the father's plural, meaning some to the false father and some to the true father. God's word, his truth, has a way of doing that. In this research on Elijah, I want you to understand the events that transpired in Elijah's ministry as he walked the earth before he was taken away, that is before death, he did not die, is very important because within that we understand what he will be doing when he returns. There was a three and a half year drought, which is the equivalent of the three and a half years, the famine of the end times. We find Elijah within this, where he has found the widow that is symbolic of Israel, her son, the generations following, and the two sticks uh, being Judah and Israel that would be joined together. I believe it is this Elijah that shall ultimately accomplish uh, that with God's truth. Now, with that thought in mind, Elijah's credentials as being a man of God were proven to the widow when he brought the son back to life as the truth brings life back into the true tribes of Israel. We had begun chapter 18. We had finished the first two verses. Elijah continues after the experience with the widow. Uh, again, he's going to approach Ahab. Ahab being the apostate ruler of this time. As the true Elijah in the end times will return to apostate church, a church deceived by false, a false god, which is to say Antichrist and his system. Verse 3 of chapter 18, 1 Kings. Let's go with it. And Ahab, this means uncle in the Hebrew tongue, called Obadiah. Obadiah in the Hebrew tongue being the servant of God, the servant of Yah which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. He believed in Almighty God. I want you to note that in Israel at this time there was only one prophet, Jezebel. Uh, that old harlot had already had killed off, if you would, most of the prophets, except with the exception of some we will find in this chapter 4. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. 
This is the first uh, record, in a sense, of a civil law overweighing a religious law. That is to say, the law of the prophet done by Jezebel, that old harlot, who herself thought it was religious, only she was a Baal worshiper. She worshiped the wrong uh, Messiah. Understand. Verse 5. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go unto the, to, uh, the land unto all fountains of water, and to all brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. It was dry. But remember this, beloved. The famine in the end times, that last three and a half years, will not be for, um, for water as we know it. It will not be for bread. It will be for truth, the truth of God's word, as it is written in the Minor Prophets. 6. So they divided the land between them to pass through out it. Ahab went one way himself, by himself, and Obadiah, this servant of God, went another way by himself. 7. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him and fell on his face, and he said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? In other words, Ahab had searched diligently in all the known world for this prophet. Why? Whereby he could be put to death. 8. And he answered him, I am. Go, tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. You go tell Ahab your master that Elijah is here. Verse 9, And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? Elijah, what have I done to you that now you want me to, to be delivered to Ahab and be slain by him? And he explains why. 10, As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to, to seek thee. And when they said, He is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation, and they found thee not. In other words, they had to take an oath, an oath even to the death, if you would. Now listen why Obadiah is so nervous. 11, And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. 12, And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee with a I know not. Uh, and so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. I love the Lord with all my heart. I have since I was a small boy. But just as sure as I go tell him you're here, God will take you away as he has in the past in every nation, every country. We've hunted under every rock, nook, and cranny. We haven't found you. Now, he will kill me if you're not here when I return. But he continued, I love the Lord with all my heart ever since I was a small boy, 13. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? Don't you know the good things I did, Elijah? How, that, how I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. I've done good things for the Lord. 14, and now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. You know, it's a strange thing. As they, this one, feared to bear the news of Elijah, when a man or a woman of God teaches God's truth straight on, boldly, they're not exactly good news to be found in the neighborhood. It's not, they are not the conversational piece of, the, uh, of a dinner, we might say. You see, when people are deceived, the real truth burns. The real truth stings. They like to turn their back upon it, but their hearts and their minds are drawn to it because they know God's truth uh, when they hear it. They cannot put it away. Yet one that truly serves God, as Obadiah, again in the Hebrew tongue meaning a servant of God, I don't think it's any accident that his 
Hebrew name fully translated has that meaning. 15. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. You don't have to worry, Obadiah. When you return, I swear before the Almighty Father that I'll be here and I'll show myself to Ahab. That should have taken a lot of fear away from him. And therefore, 16, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. Now comes the message of when the true prophet meets the apostate. I want you to bear in mind and, and see the correlation between the apostasy of the end times when God's elect through one leader that will return brings God's truth to our people, bringing them back to life, spiritual life that is, not physical. We see the debate that shall transpire. These events will happen and they will happen in this generation. Perhaps you will recognize them when they come to pass. Listen, 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Trouble him with what, beloved? The truth. Our people don't like to be troubled with the truth. They set up seminaries that were originally set to a standard to teach people that could not read or write. And years and years and years go by, they still use the same formula. That is to say, Using the same word, that's fine. But teaching on a level to people that could not read or write. People can read and write in this generation. The children are very wise. It is time to move past that, to rip down old seminaries and begin to teach God's word in the seminaries, teaching the ministers first, whereby then they may spread the truth to, to a troubled world. A world that needs to know the truth of what tomorrow brings to break down the barriers of the unknown and let light shine into, the, into this world whereby people cannot be anxious about what tomorrow brings. For in the letter from our Father it is written, and with that comes peace of mind. That will be the mission of this one Elijah. Verse 12. Ahab having spoken to Elijah, Elijah answers. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house. It's you, Ahab, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. You're nothing but a Baal worshiper, and you've bowed your knee to Baal. Many of the apostates, all the apostates, that's what apostasy means, beloved. They give up their professed believing for Jesus to worship simply the wrong Jesus. That's the deception. It isn't that they will change their religion. It is that they are, they are not educated in God's word to the point that they know the false Messiah comes first. Therefore, they will substitute the instead of Jesus for Jesus. Most major teachings lead to him, though they be false teachings, the traditions of man, the sayings of man, and not the word of God. So what has Elijah said? It is not I that trouble Israel. It is not I that bring uh, hardships upon this great nation. But it is those that are not acquainted with God's law to know the protection that he would offer for it. Uh, were we to follow that as a people. 19. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. You bring them all out to that pleasant place. And the prophets of Baal, 450. You bring along 450 of your sharpest super preachers. And the prophets of the grove, 400. Your evangelists bring 400 of them which eat at Jezebel's table. In other words, what it means is Jezebel supports them. You go bring 850 false preachers that feed at the whore's table. That's to say the great harlot of the end times. 
teaching Jesus? Yes, Jesus stated in Mark 13, they'll come in my name claiming they're teaching Jesus, but they're not. They rather teach instead of Jesus. That's to say, false Messiah, the one that will appear very soon to tell them that he's come to rapture them away. And you know something? They're going to believe him and suck their whole churches into it. So the table is set. The great mystery, what is Babel? That's Babylon, the Babylon of the end times that feeds them, that supports them, that does most of their translating for them for within themselves they are not able to handle the manuscripts at the mouth of our Father. They have let that skill fall by the wayside and they listen rather to the traditions of man. Verse 20. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together into Mount Carmel. Going to be quite a sight here. We see all these remnants of Israel, all tribes, gathered on Mount Carmel, this fruitful place, thus the meaning and 850 super preachers and evangelists. 450 preachers and 400 evangelists. Woo! What a stack. 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And the people answered him not a word. They, they said, they wouldn't answer that. He says, why do you have this double, this split standard? You see, there is a time coming when, beloved, you're going to have to make your mind up whether you're going to listen to the so-called super preachers when they tell you this man that stands in Jerusalem is Jesus. I tell you he shall not be as long as you're in a flesh body. Did you hear me? I said, he will not be Messiah if you are still in a flesh body. For the instant Yeshua Messiah, the Son of the living God, sets foot on the Mount of Olives, you will be changed in an instant, the twinkle of an eye. But there's coming a false, uh, a fake, a false Jesus that's going to say, I've come to rapture, I've come to carry away, and he shall take many. So you're going to have to make your mind up. You're going to have to do away with this dual opinion that you're going to fly away like a butterfly or you're going to fly right into Jezebel's bed with Antichrist. It's time there was a little maturity among the scholars of God's Word. You see, there is a difference between scholars of God's Word and scholars of the traditions of men. Two separate opinions. The only opinion that will save you is to follow the true Christ, for He is the only Savior. You can be saved and be told, don't worry, don't study, don't worry, you'll be gone. You're going to be gone on a road to hell. God hates lazy people. No one is going to hell until the end of the millennium. God Himself sends the delusion, but many of you are going to receive it that do not have eyes to see or ears to hear. The dual opinion. You'd better know. Well, how can I tell? I'm not a scholar. How do I know? You listen to the simplicity of the teachings of Christ. He could not have made it any simpler. A child can understand. God's sheep, Christ's sheep, know His voice, and they follow Him, not the false shepherd. Here you see the example set forth of the end times. Which will it be? Jesus or instead of Jesus? Super preachers that teach rapture, deception, or this one man that teaches, this Elijah, this prophet, he's coming. You will have the truth taught. Which will it be? Well, I've always uh, gone with the majority. Go ahead. Go ahead. If that titillate your mind, then so be it. But listen to the word of God, you that have eyes to see. Verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, 
remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men, not to mention the 400 evangelists. 23. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under it and I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. In other words, don't you let them strike a match. Neither will I. 24. And call ye on the name of your gods, plural, small g. And I will call on the name of the Lord, Yahweh. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. Stop this foolishness. Stop this dual opinion. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And that's fair. It's fair to have 850 to 1 is what they felt. We've got a cinch on this little jewel. 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. Don't you go near it with a match or a flint. You stay away from it. You see, beloved, how ridiculous majority becomes. Whoever it is that is with God will have the victory. Numbers has nothing to do with it absolutely nothing to do with it. It's whether you understand the letter your father has written you. And do you know something? If you don't understand the letter that he personally, the creator of the heavens and the earth, personally wrote to you, then you deserve to be deceived. I didn't say read it. I said understand it. Verse 26. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us, yabba 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 do. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped up on the altar which was made. Having a regular old tent revival, friend. Super preachers and evangelists running in circles, blabbering and babble, pouring from their mouths. Up and down they jumped on the very platform, is what it said, putting on a real show. But there was no voice coming from God, for their God had no power. 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. I don't blame him. I mock the super preachers sometime today and said, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's talking, he's busy, he's too busy for you, or he is pursuing, he's out chasing something, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth. Maybe he's just asleep and must be awake. So you keep blabbering, keep talking your little blah, 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 tongues, and listen closely and hear the voice. You see, that's why true tongues is not babble and not a bail, but of the true, clear speech that was spoken on Pentecost Day that needed no interpreter. It shall return when this one Elijah returns. Until then, let the mockers be mocked. 28. I don't mean make fun of people necessarily. In your heart you can. They don't know any better. They've studied in seminaries that Again, we're taught to teach people that can't read or write. 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves with their manner, with knives and lancets, till the blood gushed out upon them, this heathenistic ritual. 29. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Their God had no time for them. Why? It was not the time of Antichrist, which will have much power. But Baal had just run out of gas for them because he was as much of a God as they had ever had. They're putting on the show and working up the people in emotionalism 
could not light the match under the altar. It is significant that you note the time of day, the evening oblation. The evening oblation is what? The daily sacrifice. Who became the daily sacrifice? Had you ever thought about that in connection? It's very important. Jesus. We need no more daily oblation because he came low in the volume of the book, for he is the book, uh, and became that sacrifice where it was no longer necessary. <clears throat> Verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Have you? Do you know how to repair the altar of God that is broken down with traditions of man and lies that deceive the people concerning rapture, which not, is not even written, nor can the word be found in the word of God? 31. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Do you know where those ten tribes are today? Or do you count all of Israel in one little old tribe, Judah, which won't fit, won't fly? You make God out a liar when you say Judah is all of Israel, for that is not true. It is the promise to our Father that His children would become as numerous as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the sea. Don't try to tell me that's 19 million people. God can count. And that is why in this scripture concerning this Elijah that shall come, shall recount every tribe. And of those stones, God can raise up children through adoption. 32. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain, contain two measures of seed. That's three foot wide he dug a ditch. 33. I'm going to hurry right on down through this. And he put the wood in order, and he cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt off sacrifice and on the wood. You soak it down until it is saturated. 34. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. Emphasis. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. Let there be no doubt when a true man of God or woman of God comes by, there is power in the true name. There are miracles uh, even to this day today. 35. And the water ran around about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, right on schedule, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known. Let it be what? Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant. Give me my credentials, Father, he's saying, and that I have done all these things at thy word, not by the impulse of some man, not on my own, he's saying, but by thy word. And beloved, that's why it's important that you know as it is written, it shall be by the word of Almighty God. That's why you can count on that word. It will happen as it is written. Here you have the apostate standing around the altar, wondering which God will I serve. And this man of God, this one Elijah, stands to give credentials. Listen to them. 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, not these Baal creature babblers, rapture theorist, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Completely, utterly, not one match struck the almighty power of our Father. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That day is coming again soon, beloved. See that you don't jump up from here and immediately start praying for mountains to fall on you because of having worshipped Antichrist. 
thinking he was Jesus. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook um, Kashan and slew them there. False preachers uh, shall be destroyed. They will not deceive our people again until Satan is released a short period. Let us pray to our Father that they will have learned his truth rather than be put themselves on ego trips to become false witnesses or whatever their category concerning his word. Father's truth is very simple and there is no room for a man to go on an ego trip. It is our Father that is King of Kings, uh, his Son that is to say King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We have but one King. The rest of us are servants. So we see the apostasy put to rest. It shall be in this generation. This one shall return in the next lecture, and don't miss it. We will give him those final credentials. These events happen to prove to you that as it was in the beginning, so it shall be at the end. These examples set forth with the final proof coming that day when those two witnesses rise from the streets of Jerusalem, as it is written in Revelation 11. Then you will know who the true God is. Which will you have served before that moment? The warnings are throughout the word of God, even as in this one Elijah, which we will complete in the next lecture. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment. I want to share something. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. All right, bless your hearts. Say hey, we're back. There's the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645 in this great state of Arkansas, 787-5556. If you have a question, comment, prayer request, Think them out well. Let's keep the telephone bills cut down. Um, we only take questions and prayer requests over the lines by the operator. So think it out well and be able to keep your conversation short. We appreciate it. Our Father appreciates it, for He's the one that pays the bill. Shelby from Virginia, ask for prayer that she can get along with her, uh, her neighbors. All right, you set that Christian example. Oh, Greg from Vermont, I believe that is a, a prayer request. Please pray for friend Karen and uh, that she miscarried. Pray for her and her husband. Well, we'll sure do that. That's a shock, and the Father is able. There's a reason for everything. There Sometimes there comes along a soul that's too good for this earth age, and the Father carries them home. Okay, uh, Jesse, please pray for 
me that I will do what God wants me to do. Please pray for my family. We'll do that. Okay. And this is from Ply. No, that's for, it's from WF. Uh, please pray for my sister who is only 65 years old and is paralyzed. Okay. Um, and from Daniel. I have a family of five. Two of my girls are, Amy and Terry are watching you with me. Would you, would you help me pray for my wife, Linda, and my son, Danny? If it be God's will, I want my whole family to have eyes to see in here. You just keep that example coming, you all, and the, the Father will handle. Tom from Tennessee, prayer for a very bad food allergy. Claire from Pennsylvania needs prayer. Her friend was killed in an auto accident, and her name was Kathy. Kathy's home with the Lord now. You just praise God for, for the fact um, that she is with him and rejoice for her in that. And yet we are selfish, and we do hurt. And we pray for you and that family for comfort. Helen from West Virginia, we thank everyone for their prayers for our son who had open heart surgery, came through it fine. Praise God. And we would like to request prayers for his continued improvement. And we thank you and all. We love you all so much. Well, God bless you all. Father, you hear the cries of the children. We ask that these prayers be granted, Father. Father, thy word is truth. We know that. Um, these that have ears to hear and eyes to see, Father, as a special request on their behalf for themselves and our great nation, that it be cleansed, Father that these be healed, protected, led, guided, and comforted in Jesus' uh, precious name. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. Okay, we're still a little behind in questions, and again, I will apologize. We'll catch up here. Okay, Ken. Pastor Murray, Mark 13, 30 tells us about the great tribulation, etc., and says, this generation shall not pass away, and so forth. Please explain this generation. Did it pass away? long ago or is it today's generation it is today's generation that generation spoken of there shall not pass away until this earth age ends it shall happen in and to this generation the tribulation will we go through it no God's tribulation whether we were here or anywhere else would not bother us we are our father's children his love <clears throat> he is only angry at his enemies okay um, and um, <clears throat> if you recent, in your recent studies, you talked about being the final generation. And then this particular party, Lyle, is talking about a project that he is on. I want to tell all of you something, and I want to make it very clear. This generation, I have no doubt, is the final generation for the fig tree was planted in 1948. But we don't know if it's a 40-year generation, a 70-year generation, or 120 or 400 as far as that's concerned. You plan your lives like you're going to be here forever, but be ready this instant. I hope I make that very clear. We are watchmen and we are to watch every moment. <clears throat> you go ahead with your project. Larry from Indiana. We have Christian friends over to hear you so we can show them. Please document the sixth and the eighth day creations of man. Also, what scriptures document the three world ages? We enjoy your teaching very, very much. Well, thank you, Larry, and those that are gathered with you there. Let me take the last question first, else I forget it. The three world ages are documented in English in the book of Peter, Second Peter chapter 3. They are also documented in other places, but you have to go into the Hebrew a little bit, and uh, we have the tapes on that. The three world ages, that is. Okay, the sixth and the eighth day. The man created on the sixth day was placed over the animals that were created before man was. On the eighth day, after the seventh day rest, God created ha -Adam, the Adam, the man. Uh, that particular man because the other men couldn't till the garden. And then created animals and had him to name them which were domestic animals that he used to tend and cultivate that garden. Our tapes, the first two in Genesis 146, make it very clear. 
Delma from California. My husband thinks the soul and the spirit are two different things. Please explain them. We certainly do enjoy your program. Well, Delma, thank you very much. We enjoy having you all with us. The soul and the spirit are two different things in this sense. The soul, I like to think of it as us. In other words, your entity, that is yourself. Regardless of what body you're in, whether it be this flesh body or a spiritual body, you keep that same soul. You will always have it. Even for the eternity, you will keep that same soul. Your spirit, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit, but man's spirit is the intellect of the soul. Or we might say in modern day English, it is the mind of the soul. And many times in Hebrew, the heart is translated instead of the spirit, which is to say the mind. I'll say that one more time. The spirit is the intellect of the soul. They are both from the same individual, but are separate parts. Daryl from North Carolina. A friend of his is divorced, and he wants to know if he can date her. She is a new Christian and has asked the Lord to forgive her. That's the beautiful thing about being a Christian. Never let anyone put you on a guilt trip. If Jesus did not have the power to, upon her repentance and forgiveness, to give her a total new start, then every Christian that walks this earth is kidding themselves. They serve a God with no power if that be the case, as many of them teach. They say, you sin, you pay forever. That's not Christ's way. And they teach a different Christ than I teach. Yes, you date her and love her and help her, help that new Christian along her way. Sam from Alabama, how did you say Satan is in heaven? How did you say Satan is in heaven? I suppose that might be why. Uh, because it's written. It's part of God's word. Satan remains in heaven until you might. Let, let's, first of all, let's go back to the beginning. Let's take the book of Job, one of the older writings in God's word. Satan went with the other angels and appeared before God. This is after he had fallen. He wanted to tempt Job. All souls are with God, some in a good state and some in a bad state, but they're not in hell. They're with him in paradise. Satan is also there and shall remain there until Michael casts him out, as it is written in Revelation chapter 12. The fact that he is cast out of heaven for a five-month period, as it is written, he is cast from heaven meaning he will remain in heaven until the last five months of this earth age. Okay, what do you mean by uh, the ready complected people were made on the eighth day? Have you got a strong concordance? Look up the word Adam and see what it means in the Hebrew. That's exactly what I said. Troy from, uh, let me say that again in case I should confuse you, Sam. Take a Strong's Concordance. If you don't have one, go buy one. They're only $20 at a Bible bookstore. I said Strong's. Do not let them sell you like a Young's. That's for the young in something. I don't know what. Not Christianity necessarily. As you see, I'm not very proud of it. Get a Strong's and go to the Greek dictionary. I'm sorry, the Hebrew dictionary. It's the word 120 in the Hebrew dictionary. See what it means for yourself. Troy from California. How does, uh, Troy is uh, five and a half years old. Um, and uh, he doesn't watch all the time, but he watches with his grandmother. How does God spank people? And that's, that's a good question, Troy. God spanks people like your parents spank you. As you are the child of your parents, we are all, whether we're adults, elderly, what have you, children of God. He is our Father. And He spanks us for the same reason that your mother or father spank you, because you might be doing something that would get you in trouble, uh, like getting too close to the street and you get a little whack. Listen, that little whack is a whack of love, Troy. 
compared to getting too close to that street and being hit with a car and they love you so much and they would miss you so much they don't want that to happen to you God always corrects his children before they really get themselves in trouble he gives them a little spanking in one way or the other to before they get in real bad trouble it can be done in many ways uh, because God is in control I hope that clarifies it for you and I know your mother will be able your grandmother will be able to take it a little further okay Chuck from Mississippi during the Apostle Paul's time when he spoke in tongues did he understand what he was actually saying naturally Paul was not an idiot the tongue Paul spoke in he was speaking to a Greek audience when he stated this the manuscripts were in Hebrew or they could have been in Greek but this more or less proves that Paul studied not the Septuagint but the Hebrew manuscripts, especially in as much as the documentation rests that he studied under a great Hebrew scholar. He spoke Hebrew fluently, a lot better than he did Greek. Did, he, did the people in other countries understand him or did he have an interpreter? He had an interpreter if he was speaking in a country that spoke a language he could not, else those people would not have understood him is speaking in tongues only for the last days against Antichrist when we are delivered up. That's when those um, tongues will be spoken, that were spoken a type on Pentecost Day. The record as Peter made it goes back to the time of Joel. When you see that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet, this is that. In other words, this is what Joel was talking about. That does not transpire until this earth age is over. Kenneth from Texas, Ezekiel 44, talks about knowing your relatives. And this means in the millennium. That's what Ezekiel 44 covers. Do you think adopted persons and aborted persons will know their natural parents at that time in the millennium? God bless the chapel and the crew. Well, thank you. <clears throat> in the first place, in the sense of adopted, yes, I believe that is true. In the sense of an abortion, then no, because that child will not be present in the millennium. That child will be in heaven with Almighty God. You will know that child after the millennium. I want to state that again. A child that is taken before the age of accountability goes straight to heaven. As I told you, some children are too good for this world. God carries them directly to to heaven. The millennium age, regardless of what some might think and or teach, is a time of salvation. They don't need salvation. They certainly have overcome. Uh, the adoption, yes, you will know them. For when you adopt them, you take them as thy own. And that is a contract and a covenant which God recognizes. In the sense of an abortion, no, you will not see them in the millennium, for they will not be present in the millennium, but will remain in heaven with the Father. Cheryl from Arizona, is it, is it true that Jesus went to hell to wrestle the keys of life and death from Satan, the time period right after crucifixion and before he went to heaven? Of course, understand figures of speech and the figure of speech and the language. All these people were in paradise. It is simply all souls go to the Father when we die, whether they're sinners or saints. They are put there in holding until Judgment Day. Many of them, as it is written in Second Ezra, chapter seven, verse seventy-seven forward, when they all first get there, they're delighted for they see God. And then some of them's face falls, for they know they did not make it. But they're still there. They are still there. The account is recorded in the book of Peter, where Jesus uh, went to those people all the way back to the time of Noah, which is a figure of speech that means the very beginning, and gave them the opportunity of salvation. Mike from Washington. Um, the... Two people in the field, one taken and one left. Does this have anything to do with the rapture theory? I mean, where they get the idea. Could you shed some light on this verse? It's in part where they get it. Many churches teach, you better pray that you're one of those taken in the field. 
The Greek is very specific. It's Antichrist that takes them. I want to say that again. The Greek manuscripts are very specific. The subject and the object is deception of Antichrist. Jesus didn't say maybe he will come. He said he will come. And he said, see that you're not deceived, for I have told you these things. The one that is taken in the field is taken by Antichrist. That is the rapture, as men teach it, as it aligns with God's word. Those that stay in that field working are the servants of the living God. Okay, Willa May from Colorado, First Chronicles 6, 1 Chronicles 6.1 and 112, are the Zadok out of the Levitical tribe, are the 7,000 elect Levites? Um, okay. The Zadok spoken of in Ezekiel chapter 44 were chosen before the foundations of this earth, which is to say they were chosen before there was ever a man named Levi. You would have to know what the word Levi means in the Hebrew tongue to understand what it has reference to in relationship to God's elect, the seven. Seven spoken of by Elijah the prophet, Romans chapter 11. It means joined. And only these 7,000, as it is written in Ezekiel 44, are joined to Christ. Meaning what? Meaning they can join themselves next to him meaning they can approach him. No one else will be able to approach Messiah during the millennium, regardless of what is taught. Won't it be wonderful to get there and rush to him? Friend, if you're deceived by Antichrist, you're not rushing to him. There will only be God's elect that stand against Antichrist. Those that have overcome before, will they're with him now, but they will not be in the millennium. Present, that is. They will be in heaven. Marie from New York, do you believe that AIDS is a plague from God? AIDS is a plague of perversion. And many might be offended instantly. What is perversion? Perversion is anything created by God used for a purpose other than he intended it. He did not intend that people jab themselves with filthy needles. He did not intend that people deal in filth. AIDS is the, is the off throw of absolutely filth. Body is the temple and it is to be cleansed. Is it a plague? Yes, it is. Because anytime you break God's law and filth and having to do with filth is breaking God's law. It is a perversion and it is his judgment. It is written. If you are a new Christian and don't know the Bible, how do you go about choosing a church and know if they're speaking the truth? God will never, uh, uh, will always, first of all, go to a church that teaches the Bible. Don't go to one of these churches where the minister reads one verse and then talks about himself or Joe Blow or somebody else for an hour. That's, that's not fitting. Run. Don't walk, run from a church that does that. They will evangelize you for 40 years and you'll be on a milk bottle when you finish. You're in a good place right here. Stay with us, learn the word, then pick your, uh, then pick your church. Just been handed some prayer requests. Anna from Virginia, prayer for a diabetic mother-in-law, also a need prayer. Okay, Monty, uh, please pray for that God for God to give me strength. He can do that. Father, you hear these cries in the power of Almighty God in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. Okay, uh, George from Florida. In Revelation 11, the two witnesses, who are the witnesses? No one knows, really, George. Many say it's Elijah and Enoch. That's a good possibility. It is a good possibility. I, it could be two people, it could be anyone, because it is two people that are able to bleed, meaning in flesh. Elijah and Enoch did not die. Well, we'll see. But the main thing is, they will be of God's elect. Jeanette from Tennessee, I have a nephew that was murdered while he was drunk. 
I've been told that no drunkard can enter into the kingdom. Can you explain this or enlighten me on this verse? Uh, have I missed this? No. But it is not your right, Jeanette, or mine, or anyone else's to judge. Let us say, in as much as this man was murdered, it is the murderer that has committed the sin. Let us say that he recognized in the last instant, before the whatever blow was struck, cried out to God. It is not man's right to judge. Uh, A drunkard um, is one um, that becomes drunk on the vial of Satan more so than a bottle. Will the Christians on earth have to go through the tribulation or will they be carried away? They will not be carried away unless they're carried away by Satan. That's the first one taken in the field. The Christians uh, will go through the tribulation of Antichrist, which is to say the first tribulation. The second tribulation is only against the enemies of God. Jerry from Alabama, what is there so, why is there so much emphasis put on speaking in tongues when it is stated as the least desirable gift? I really don't know. And uh, that's a good, a, a good thought. I'm just going to let it answer and carry its own weight. Bless your hearts, we're out of time. Seems like this hour goes so fast. Once most of you stay tuned, we're going to be right back. And remember this, if we've taught you, we are supported by your tithes and offerings. We may have to be all alone, and we're going to have to grow into this. I will allow it to be a burden to no one. God's blessings will carry it or not. If we have taught you, it becomes imperative and important if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. To help support, therefore, God's blessings will come upon you. But the most important thing, you've heard me say it before, stay in the Word. Every day, and it's a beautiful day because Jesus is the living Word. Thank you for joining with us in today's study of God's Word. If you would like to hear today's message again on audio cassette, or if you would like to know some of the other deeper, in depth studies that Pastor Murray has covered, Write for the free tape catalog. Write Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. And don't forget to mention tape catalog. Shepherd's Chapel also has a monthly newsletter letting you know what's happening at the chapel. So if you would like to receive this monthly newsletter, write to Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Thank you for joining us. And join us again each Monday through Friday at this same time for Shepherd's Chapel.